What's going on, everybody? It's the France, and we have a Wednesday night review of AEW on TNT. We are on our way to All Out, and this was an average show, in my opinion. Not really, like, AEW, I don't think, has had a bad show yet. But not every show has, not every show is going to be good. And in my opinion, this show was not good. This show was average. They had a 12-man a te- a tag team match to start off the show. The main event was okay. I will say it was okay. We had a great... Uh, we had a debate, which we'll let you listen to here in a bit. And I'm just... Well, I just... Um, I don't know what it is, but this show just did not click with me tonight. Then we had Proud and Powerful take on the best friends in a match that just for some reason, that match didn't gel. Like, I don't know what it was. I just feel like Proud and Powerful and the best friends just don't click well at all. It was, like I said, this wasn't a bad show. It wasn't a great show. It was just but an average show. And you'll have that sometimes. And AEW is not going to have... Shows what's going to be great all around. Now, we start off the show with Kenny Omega, Hangman Page, the Young Bucks, and FTR versus the Dark Order. Of course, this match is happening because of last week. Hangman Page winning his match against, I believe it was five. Brody Lee coming out, not happy with the fact that um, five lost, but pissed off at um, Hangman Page for being Hangman Page and beating who, like, like being a thorn in his side. The Young Bucks, of course, were in the crowd. They came down. FTR came down. Kenny Omega came down. And he had a big, huge brawl between everybody. And in this match, you had Stu Grayson, Evil Uno, I guess number nine, Colt Cabana, uh, Brody Lee, and um, who the fuck else was the other one in there? It was a six, it was a 12 man tag match. So who the fuck was the other one? Ten, of course, is still recovering from that injury that he had surgery on, so he wasn't in this match. And Anna Jay was up on the up by the announce table. So, if you guys haven't seen on Monday, they're doing their women's tag team tournament, which I I'm fine with them doing a the women's tag team tournament. I, should it be isolated from AEW's television show? I don't think so. I think they should take time. And since they love to do their tag team wrestling so much, I think they should at least take time out of the week to continue the women's tag team tournament on Wednesday night instead of Monday night. I mean, it's fine if they want to get the women their own time, but it's like, unless you're going to have an all-women show, which, trust me, AEW is nowhere close to being able to have an all-women show. This just wasn't it, man. So... Off to the fast start with um, Brody Lee starting up against the Young Bucks. Ten and Anna Jay, of course, as I said, standing next to Kamate. One of the minions gets thrown into the match. I think it was they said number nine. He's getting destroyed by pretty much everyone on the other on um, that babyface team. Omega and Page with a flurry of attacks cover. Uno breaks it up. FTR saves both Omega and Page from taking suplexes. Then they then FTR joins in. And FDR, Hangman Page, and Omega do a huge suplex to, I believe it was Evil Uno, number nine, and Stu Grayson. So a four on three superplex. Um, suplex. Cabana gets a shot on Omega. He start and the thing about Cole Cabana, as we know, he has been recruited pretty much from the start by the Dark Order since he started having some bad luck. And he's not 100% on Like, in the Dark Order, he doesn't, like, every time they ask him about being in the Dark Order, he's like, I'm just hanging out with these guys. In this match, Cole Cabana felt more in line with the Dark Order than he has previously. And he's tagged with them before in that match at, I believe it was Double or Nothing, not Double or Nothing, at Fighter Fest. Didn't seem like he was on the same page with them there, but here he felt more like he was starting to come around to... The Dark Order. Now, Omega chases um, Colt Cabana. And if anybody knows what's going on with that, Colt Cabana has been doing this skit with Kenny Omega where he's... It's, it's pretty much a Tom and Jerry cat and mouse thing. Where 
Tom, where um, Omega is Tom and um, Cole Cabana is Jerry, and they're running after each other. And well, well, you know, Omega's chasing Cole Cabana. So he's chasing him around, and then out of nowhere, big kick by by Brody Lee, knocking him down. Cabana just puts his hands up and he's like, I had nothing to do with that. Back in the ring, Grayson and Uno work over Omega. Uno with a boot to the face, cover two. Omega finally is able to tag in, out, tag out. Hardwood takes down five, so it was five, that's who it was. Elbow drop, cover two. Wheeler with a big power slam on five. Back suplex on Grayson. Lariat on Uno, then tags in Hardwood. Page is out there now. Five with a kick and drags him back to the corner. Grayson gets in there and chops away on Page. Omega with a blind tag. Grayson takes a ton of strikes. Assisted German suplex. Snapdragon suplex. On the Uno. Five tags in. But gets destroyed by pretty much everyone else on the on the babyface side. Nick with a step up twisting splash on three Dark Order members. Hardwood puts five over his knee. Wheeler then drops one down. Drops an elbow down on the five. While it's on Hardwood's knee. And Hardwood starts... Um, holding his knee, selling it as if that took more out of him than it did five. So, Hard Wheeler, com- um, Wheeler comes over and is like checking on his partner. He tags in Kenny Omega. He goes out. So, Hangman Page and Dax Hardwood, I'm um, sorry, not Dax Hardwood, but Cash Wheeler, help um, Hardwood out of the ring, out of the match, up the ramp, and to the back. So, at this time, it is six on three. What the hell is going to happen here? Are we going to see... And this is... I'm thinking about this as this match is going on. And I'm like... You're not going to have the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega beat six members of the Dark Order by themselves, are you? That would have killed the Dark Order completely. But... The entire team seems to check on him. And Omega tagged in. Gut Wrench, Power Barn, Cover 2. Dark Order all attack him while the other team seems more concerned about Hardwood being taken to the back. Omega with a hurricane runner. Matt finally gets back in for the tag. He runs right into a black hole slam by Brody Lee. Cover two. Now it's only Nick, Matt, and Kenny Omega as Paige and FTR walk to the back. We do not see Dak, Dax Hardwood or Cash Wheeler for the rest of the match. Dark Order beating up Matt, Nick, and Kenny can't do much. Colt with a big splash. Cover two. Matt continues to get beat up as Dark Order winning the numbers game. Lee is in the ring. Omega with a shot but then takes a big clothesline. Matt finally gets a window to tag out, but Uno pulls Nick to the floor. Grayson hits a German suplex after they do this little like they they do this um what is it called a this sequence of moves and then for whatever reason the evil Uno is on his back with his feet propped up. You have he has Matt's I'm sorry Nick on his feet and he pushes him into Stu Grayson who ends up hitting that um that that suplex. Matt tries to fend off the entire other team. He looks for a tag, but nobody is there. Hangman Page finally comes back to the ring. Matt tags him in. Page goes ballistic. He is beating everybody down in Dark Order, minus Brody Lee. Follow a slam on five. Splash to the floor on Colt Cabana. Page looks for the um, buckshot lariat on, but Uno stops him. Hits a back suplex on five on the apron. That had to hurt. Page climbs to the top and hits a moonsault on five of the guys on the floor. Back in the ring, Page wants Lee as he takes five, throws him into the corner, and is like, come on, motherfucker, we're going to do this. Page ends up losing the battle. Cole is tagged in. Cole, I'm sorry, Colt is tagged in. Hits the Chicago Skyline on Page. Cover, Omega breaks it up. Five with a double stomp on Omega. Grayson and Uno each with a big move on the... On the tag champs, Lee back in the match looks for a discus forearm. Bucks double super kick him, a bunch of gu- other guys. Omega with a snap dragon suplex with while the young Bucks super kick him. Page goes for the they go for the last call, uh, whatever they call it, the buckshot lariat, and Omega and Page pretty much go for the finisher. Brody Lee ducks it. Page almost hits Omega, but Omega the young Bucks are all pulled out of the ring. At the same time, by the remainder of the members of the Dark Order. While this is happening, Paige turns around into the Discus Lariat. Discus 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 Lariat. One, two, three, and the Dark Order are your winners. That is that. 
I was sitting there, and as soon as Hangman Page came back, I'm like, they're not going to do this, are they? They're not going to have four guys beat the Dark Order. Thankfully, that didn't happen. I think that would have been a terrible mistake, but they didn't. So, that was that. Then, we see the best friends pull up into the building with Trent's mom's van. They will face Santana and Ortiz. We're back to that 12-man tag match. Was it a good match? Not really, in my opinion. Was it as bad as last week? No. This one, and it's kind of funny. It's just kind of amazing how you have a 10-man tag team match last week. And that 10-man tag team match was a clusterfuck so badly that the rest of the show felt like... The rest of the show felt like a real, like the real, the real episode of wrestling last week, and that first match just seemed like something they should have had on the undercard, or like on a pre-show of pay-per-view. This one wasn't as bad as that, but it was still like I like six-man tag matches are as high as we should go. We don't need to add another two on each, one on each side, or two on each side, or three on each side. Next thing you know, Tony Khan will come up with this big, great idea when ten's not hurt. To have a 20-man tag team match. And we don't need to see that. But like I said, we have Santana and Ortiz versus the best friends. Then we hear from John. It's best better to hear from the champ than to hear from me on this. When I was younger, I'm not ashamed to say that I struggled with a lot of demons. Early in my career, I'd go to the ring... And it's like I'm wrestling ghosts. The people who cared about me would often try to talk me out of stuff. Don't fight that guy. Don't do that death match. Don't do this or that. Cut it out. And looking back, in some cases, I wish I'd have listened to them. Because I paid a price. But in some cases, looking back, I wouldn't change a thing. So I get it. I get why Darby Allen pointed at my belt. I get why Darby Allen challenged me for my title. I understand where you're coming from, what you're trying to do. But in an ironic twist, I have become the advocate. I have become the voice of reason. I've become the person concerned for somebody's health. Because I know Darby Allen is gonna come at me and come at me and come at me. And he's not gonna stop until he can't move. And it's never gonna cross his mind once that the last time we wrestled, I nearly broke his neck. But it weighs heavily on me. I don't necessarily want on my resume, I'm the guy who ended Darby Allen's bright career. He's my favorite guy in AEW. But the title's on the line, man. When you sign that contract, you made yourself just like everybody else. And I gotta do what I gotta do. I'm not gonna try to talk you out of anything. But I have to ask you, please, please, when it's time to stay down, just stay down. Even though I know you're not going to listen. Because I wouldn't. That's from John Moxley for his opponent tonight. Always has a hell of an interview. Always a heck of a promo from John Moxley. I just... He says it best. He says it best. That this would be... The, the, the main event match, which we'll get to later... Wasn't the worst match I've seen. It wasn't the best match. It was a good match. It's just because of the timing, I think it was, or the fact that it was on that regular TV and you had that commercial break because they've been doing picture in picture with this giveaway, which, of course, I wish I would win, but you know, I haven't. It's just... But, yeah, it was a good, it was a good promo. Darby's down, and I, I don't remember him almost breaking his neck. I'd have to go back and watch that first match, but yeah. Definitely one of those things that, that John Moxley 
has a long long career that he has learned a lot from. And somebody put this tweet tweet out there. Uh, to talk about skyrocketing careers. Who has benefited more from AEW than Darby Allen? And honestly, I can think of MJF and Orange Cassidy, and that's about only ones I can think of that have that star making potential, like that star making moments, multiple star making moments in their career in AEW. And Darby Allen is definitely one of them. And him and John Moxley, I could see them going back and forth with each other over the next, I don't know, four or five years, however long John Moxley has left in professional wrestling. But after tonight, I still don't think this is the last time we see these two go at it. Santana and Ortiz was the best friends. I don't know why this match is happening. I know the whole Cassidy and um, Jericho thing is still going on. And that's going to be a match next week. But, mm, like I said earlier at the beginning of this. This match felt like it dragged on way too long. I don't know if these guys just like have like a mistiming or something. It just, this match felt like something was off the entire time. I can't put my finger on what was wrong with this match. But it just, like, it started off fine. And then it just never seemed to get out of that first or second gear to get where we needed to be. I know um, Trent, for the majority of this match, was selling a back injury. But it just never felt like it got to... Where a Santana and Ortiz match can get. I don't know if it's because it's the best friends and they don't have, they can't work at the same speed that Santana and Ortiz can work at. It just felt like there was something missing in this match, honestly. But Santana and Taylor get things going with some map wrestling, neither of us are getting much of an advantage. Taylor finally gets the first pinfall attempt for a two count. Santana with a kick to the midsection. And tags in Ortiz, he merely takes down Trent and he's, he's take down, taken down. Trent is tagged in with the arms standing double knee stomp, northern late suplex, two count. Taylor tags in, Ortiz swing. Oh, I'm sorry, Ortiz. Wow. Ortiz swings away from on both guys, best friends with a flurry attacks. Ortiz gets planted to the mat, best friends do the signature hug thing, which, by the way, Excalibur again wasn't on commentary, he wasn't there at all. For these two tapings last week. So of course he wasn't going to be here tonight. So having I think it was Tony Schiavone say. Gotta give the people what they want. Just didn't sound them right. Because he didn't have the. Got to give the people what they want. Enthusiasm that you would get from Excalibur. Now on speaking of Excalibur. I have not seen a statement or anything from that, from AEW. Or from Excalibur. So I don't know what's going on with that. Bathing back and forth chops in the middle of the ring. Ortiz and Trent on between Ortiz and Trent. Ortiz gets the best of Trent though. Brings Santana and Santana. Commentary notes that the Ain't Women's Tag Team Tournament Cup will continue on YouTube because we need to know that now. Trent continues to get the the best beat up on the outside. Trent launches launched into the barricade. Taylor sent over the barricade back in the ring. Ortiz with a suplex cover one count. Trent selling a back injury. Ortiz tags in, double team, vertical suplex. Trent finally fights off his opponents and is able to tag out Taylor with a couple of clotheslines, standing sliced bread, drives Santana to the mat, cover for two, soul food on Ortiz, Falcon Air cover another two. Ortiz puts on the top, put, put on the top rope, Trent tags in for whatever reason, but Santana runs over, hits him straight in the injured back, and that rocks him. Taylor gets rid of Santana, T- Trent and Taylor's shoulders, on Taylor's shoulders, and they were able to hit the multi- the, the massive superplex onto Ortiz, who sells it very well. And Trent eats a rolling cutter from Santana, Ortiz with a sit-out powerbomb. Santana with a knee to the face, cover two. Santana and Ortiz look for the street sweeper, but Trent, on Trent, but Taylor knocks Santana off the top rope. And then Trent rolls up Ortiz and gets the win. And I'm sitting here thinking, wow, that has got to be one of the lamest finishes of the... Like, I, I, I hate that when they do shit like that. Like, seriously, that's the best finish you could give me? That? I mean, come on. That's the best you could do. So... 
After that, we go to MJF at his campaign headquarters. We get an update from MJF's he campaign headquarters. Nothing special here, just him, you know, just continuing his push for being the World Heavyweight Champion. Not much really there. Matt Hardy's in the ring talking about this bla the, the blast being able to show off his personalities, but he listened to his audience, much like AEW does. AEW does says he wants to focus on being him through on through, through the on screen as well as off screen. He wants to help keeping other, helping others. Bring up private party. He brings up private party and says if they need anything from him, he's here for him. And there's also this other guy I tried to help, and that was Sammy Guevara. And hold him to get away from Chris Jericho. Guevara didn't listen though. Hardy says Guevara once climbed out of the uh, climbed out once climbed out from under the ring and attacked Hardy. So Hardy decided on his first night back last week that I might as well return the favor. Then we see Guevara sneak out from under the ring and shows up behind Matt. Sammy and I'm sorry, Matt's still talking. And then he's like, "Sammy, I knew you'd come." Instead of doing it in the broken version, he did it himself. Turn around, they brawl, they beat the hell out of each other. Sammy Guevara gets put through the small little announcers, um, the little um, co the ring announcers table. Matt gets another table, sets it up, but Sammy Guevara turns it around, gets Matt Hardy on this, puts Matt Hardy on this table, grabs a chair, throws it at Matt. The leg catches Matt Hardy in the head. We, I, you don't think anything, you don't think anything of it until Sammy Guevara goes up top. Hits a, I say a 450, um, a, a three, a 630 or some kind of like cannonball splash. And when he sends Matt Hardy through the table, that's when you see the blood. The, ta the, the chair caught Matt Hardy in the head. And he was bleeding so badly that the corner of the table was blood red. It was nasty. So, yeah, that, that looked nasty. And then, and that was definitely not a, that was definitely not a cut that you would, like, that was not a blade job, because if you blade, you're not going to blade so bad, bleed so badly, unless you're Eddie Guerrero, who cuts, who cuts so deep, he hits his fucking artery, but you're not going to bleed so badly that it just cascades onto the fucking table. If it would have been a blade job, that would have been a little bit of blood, and it would have stopped already. But he got nicked up pretty fucking badly. I hope Matt Hardy's okay after that. Outside the building, we see... Because at, while this is going on, or after this happens, like, Joe's like, what's going on out there? Um, we're going to the, um, out to the back. So we see Santana and Ortiz with some weapons come up to the car of the best friends. Apparently, it's Trent's mom's. Okay, whatever, I don't think they're actually going to wreck somebody's actual legitimate car. Come on. But they take a sledgehammer and a baseball bat, I believe it was, to this van, breaking all the windows, smashing up the windshield, painting it. He put, like, Sue with an X through it and everything. So, that's what you get for pissing off Pretty Powerful. So, yeah, that was that. They, of course, want a rematch, and apparently that's going to be happening sometime soon. Matt Cardona and the TNT champion Cody versus Alex Render on John Silver's of the Dark Quarter. This was Matt Cardona's in-ring debut for AEW, and it was a good match. It, Matt Cardona, I have not seen, I have not seen so, uh, so much fire in this guy's work in forever. I don't know when the last time. I think the last time he had this much, like, passion and this much, like, vitriol to actually go out there and have, I think that's the right word, have a match, a wrestle match like this, was when he won the United States Championship or when he was built working towards becoming a United States Champion. Matt Cardona went out there and he looked good. So... A shovel match between Cody and Silver. Cody drops down to the uppercut, then does an extra delayed vertical suplex. Cardona is tagged in, hits a big clothesline on Silver, throws him into the turnbuckle, flapjack cover, one count. Kicked by Silver. Tags in Reynolds, but he's dropped with a net breaker. Cody get tags in. 
and drops down on Reynolds' arm. Cody's sent into the corner. He goes down and slides rib first. In, it wasn't rib first. It was like arm first. I don't know what happened here, but Cody like slides and he is like under, like his, it was just weird that his like, not his shoulder, but the underside of his arm got caught into the um, ring post because he slid and his arm was like laid out. So he hit the, hit the ring post with his arm and that, that just looked terrible. Not, not a terrible as in it was a bad spot. It just, it looked terrible and painful. So Cody is compromi compromised now. Big punches to Reynolds, but he still can't get, still holding his um, side. Cody ends up on the apron. Tr Silver trips down on, in, on, down, down on hit. Reynolds with a slingshot double stomp on him. Reynolds and Silver with back and forth elbow drops cover one. More kicks to Cody's midsection and by Silver, then tags in Reynolds. Cody tries to fight back, but his ribs, are, but his side is troubling him. He really needs to tag out, but is keeping kept in the wrong part of town. More kicks land on Cody. I mean, Reynolds hit a lot of like a big, huge combination of kicks to Cody that looked devastating as can be. Holy shit! Cardona. Matt lands a missile drop kick, then throws shots. Cardona with a double underhook set out power bomb, but gets kicked to the face. Dark Order goes back to down to attack Cardona. Back and forth into a German suplex in the bridge for a two count. Cardona gets sent to the outside. Cody's back into the ring, looks for a crossroads, blocks Silver, then suplexes him, then does this double suplex this, this suplex over the ape over the top rope down to the outside has been used. Way too many times over the last few months. It's a cool spot when you do it once in a while, but you need to not do it every, every like every week or every other week. It's just so ridiculous. Cardona hits the radio silence known as the Rough Rider in WWE for the one, two, three. Cody and Matt Cardona are your winners. Again, Cardona looked good, and I don't know what's gonna happen next to him for him. I know he has a long term, a, sh a short term deal. I guess five appearances. This is appearance number two. Nothing for him was announced for next week, so who knows what they're going to be doing with him. Post match, Cody is in smiles and everything. He makes his way to the back, but before he le he gets to uh, gets to the tunnel, Scorpio Sky shows up, walks over. They're having a little stare down. He taps the title and wants a match. And it will happen next week. That's going to be one hell of a match, in my opinion. Outside is next to the destroyed. Um, Van, best friends, are not happy at all with Santana and Ortiz. Trent calls them callous for what they did. Taylor says all they do, all they had to do was ask if they wanted the rematch. And they can't, um, they can't wait to kick their ass again. And next time, after we beat your asses, you're going to personally apologize to my mom. Via speakerphone. So, we have a debate. Who was the special moderator to this debate? The only person, as it was, of course, spoiled apparently a couple weeks ago, a couple days ago or so. It's Eric Bischoff. Here it is, part one. Thank you very much and welcome the AEW Super Wednesday Debate 2020. Now the format for this debate is very simple. We have five questions that we put together through various AEW social media platforms. They were picked at random. Neither Mr. Cassidy nor Mr. Jericho have seen these questions. Why does Chris Jericho and Orange Cassidy hate each other so much? <laughs> Lame question. Well, that's an easy one, uh, Eric. But first of all, before I verbally annihilate you, Orange, I want to say I sure am glad you dressed for the occasion tonight. It's disgraceful. You're right. He gets the tie out of his pocket and puts the clip-on tie on. 
You see, th this is what I hate. No, no, hate's not strong enough a word. This is why I despise you, Cassidy. You take nothing seriously. I despise who you are. I despise who you stand for. And I despise the millions of morons who follow you and everywhere you go and think you're the greatest thing in pro wrestling history. But I'll tell you something, you're not. The As a matter of fact, people laugh at you behind your back, Orange. You're a joke. Critics, historians, experts, they laugh at everything you do, and so do I. You're nothing. You're a nobody. You're a flash in the pan. Nothing more than a ginger jackass who plays pocket pool on a weekly basis. And Mr. Bischoff, I am finished with my statement. It's tremendous. Great nature, Chris. Well, Mr. Cassidy, I must say I am rather looking forward to your response. <laughs> um, yeah, he's going to talk. Mr. Mr. Cassidy, your response, please. He doesn't talk, Eric. He's got nothing to say. Very well. We'll uh, we will move on, I guess, with the next question. Who is the better wrestler? And who is the biggest star, Chris Jericho or Orange Cassidy? <laughs> Easy E, with all respect, don't be an idiot. I mean, I'm Chris Jericho, man. I'm the champion. I'm the demo god. I've held 50 titles around the world. Orange Cassidy hasn't even been out of the state of Florida. <laughs> And the only title he's ever had was being named the biggest slacker in his high school yearbook. And I'll tell you this, if we went to high school together, Orange, I'd chase you down the hall, kick your ass in front of the lockers, give you a wedgie, steal your milk money, and take your girlfriend. You're a nerd. I stand here in a $10,000 suit looking like... Huh, a million bucks, you stand there in a filthy denim jacket that smells like old salami, Dracar Noir, and batteries. You make me sick. Eric. All right then, Mr. Cassidy, your response, please. Let's move this along. I'm sure this one's going to really register here with Mr. Cassidy, but uh, global sea levels have been rising over the past century. The rate has increased in recent decades. What are your thoughts on this very serious global situation? What? <laughs> Chef, what are you talking about? That's really? That's the best question someone can come up with? Really? Got nothing to do with this situation. Next question. Cassidy? <laughs> sea level continues to rise at about the rate of one eighth of an inch per year. A higher sea level enables storm surges to push further inland and therefore increase the extremely dangerous flooding in coastal communities. Failure to minimize our fossil fuel use and reduction of carbon emissions could be devastating to the estimated 40% of the population in the United States that lives in these coastal communities and globally eight of the world's largest 10 cities. Thank you. What the fuck was that? Well, what the fuck was that? As we continue. I think we have us a debate. That comes from. What the hell? Let's get to the next question. Why is Orange Cassidy so popular? You know why he's so popular? I'll tell you why. Because he's the epitome of everything that's wrong in pro wrestling today. He's the epitome of every idiot smart mark fan in this arena tonight and watching at home. He's lazy, he's arrogant, he's entitled. He's overbearing, and he's a pimple on the ass of the pro wrestling business. But next week, Orange, I'm going to pop you. I'm going to beat you again for the second time. And when I do, when my hand is raised, you're going to have to give me $7,000 to replace 
this designer creation that seems to get oranger every single week from whatever you put in that demonic orange juice of yours. And after you're embarrassed, after you pay me the money, you're going to walk out of here, you're going to leave AEW, you're going to quit the pro wrestling business and go back to being Jim the Jabba Juice guy down at the mall, and you're going to take my order of a blueberry smoothie with extra protein and pumpkin seeds, and guess what? I'm not going to give you a tip. Mr. Cassidy, your response, please. Nothing. Next question. Last question. Why does this rematch mean so much to both of you? Well, the reason why the rematch means so much to hey, me is... Hey, Chris, shut up. Shut up. Chris, I know what you're doing here. I know what this is. I mean, you scheduled a debate against a guy who doesn't talk. It's pretty smart. You're just trying to embarrass me, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, I am. Trying to embarrass me with all this? Mm -hmm. I'm not embarrassed, Chris. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about you, but I do care about next week. See, I care about that match. I do. I mean, it's the biggest match of my life. It's also the biggest match of your life too, Chris. Really? Can you imagine, Chris? I mean, you're Chris Jericho, man. You've done it all. All the things that we can Google later. But I'm telling you right now, Chris, what if this, what is Chris Jericho loses to the guy that puts his hands in his pockets? I want you to look at me, Chris. I want you to look into my eyes and look at the man that is going to embarrass you. And next week, Look at the man that's going to beat you. Well, how about that? Shock, shock. This was inside of Orange Cassie. It just came out right here in this debate. That's well, my answer. I have no choice here but uh, to declare that, Mr. Cassidy, you've walked away with this debate. Yep, and of course Chris Jericho would not be happy about that. He said he sicked um, Jake Hager, who was there with him on Orange Cassidy. He beats the hell out of him. Juice effect. That was that. Next week, that is going to be a match. Then we move on to I don't know what the fuck this was. I don't know who thought this was a good idea. Of course, last week Britt Baker was like, well. Big Swole, you want a match with me? Fine, you could have one with me at a later date if you beat somebody of my choosing. Who do you think she picked? She picked Reba Rebel, her sidekick, her little, um, her, whatever you want to call that, her, yeah. So, Swole beat the hell out of her. She tried for something and she ended up getting hit with the discus, the Dirty Dancing Discus Lariat. One, two, three. Big swole one. Nothing special, nothing to talk about. But next week, next week, we have two singles matches that are going to be huge. As we know, Chris Jericho versus Orange Cassidy will be happening, as well as Cody versus Scorpio Sky for the TNT Championship. Now, Last night on Dark, Scorpio Sky cut a promo after his match talking about how he's tired of waiting, tired of just being treated as a the king of Dark. And he's tired of waiting for opportunity. He's going to go take it. Now, if they wanted to give somebody a chance to beat Cody for this championship, I could see no better person to do it right now than Scorpio Sky. 
give the guy a chance to win this match, win the title, and go on to be, if he wants to do open challenges, maybe, maybe he turns heel, maybe he wins by low blowing, by low blow behind the back of the referee, he turns on SCU, and becomes his own man. I mean, he's already using his own theme music. He's not even... I mean, he has his own theme music, his own entrance. It's like he comes out by himself. He doesn't even come out with SCU unless they're doing a six-man tag match. I can honestly see them breaking Scorpio Sky away 100% away from SCU by having him beat Cody next week for the championship. I could be totally wrong. I'm most likely wrong. But honestly... Who better right now to beat Cody for that championship and start and give somebody a chance to be launched to a higher stratosphere than having Scorpio Sky win it? That's just my opinion on that. Also, if you remember last week during the contract signing, or it was a week before that, we were going to have a tag team appreciation night hosted by FTR. Hangman Page and Kenny Omega will take on Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus non-title match. Grayson and Evil Uno of the Dark Order will take on the Young Bucks. And an appearance by the Rock and Roll Express, Tully Blanchard, and Arn Anderson for Tag Team Appreciation Night. So, I don't see where this I don't see where this is going to go. But with the fact that you're going to have Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard in this segment, maybe we see some kind of affiliation with FTR and all that stuff come to light. I have no idea. Main event, John Moxley versus Darby Allin, AEW World Heavyweight Championship match. This was, again, a fun match. It wasn't bad. Darby Allin back to wearing his the face of his opponent on him with wearing John Moxley's face. He keeps the match on as the match begins. Moxley finally just cocks him, cold cocks him in the face to after he was the, after he was the um, face off. And Allen must have been hit hard because he's already bleeding early on in this match. So these guys have themselves a scrap of a match. Towards the end of the match, Wardlow shows up. He comes down to distract the referee. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, MJF with the world title smashes it over John Moxley's face. Darby Allen, of course, is down at this time. Referee turns around. John Moxley's down. Darby Allen doesn't know what the fuck just happened. Goes up for the coffin drop. One, two, kick out, barely. And in the end, how did this end? Again, hold on. Actually, I actually turned. I actually um, I actually missed out on the ending because of. Okay, so Moxley actually towards the after that had a sleeper hold. On or a, a bully choke on Darby Allen. He's telling him to tap. He's telling him to tap. And Ma- and Darby Allen with both hands, with both knee uh, elbows on the mat, puts his hands up and gives him the double bird. And Moxley is not happy about that. Moxley hits the Gotch style power driver pin and gets a two count. He can't believe it. Picks him up, hits the Death Rider, and wins the match. After the match, he says some words to Allen backstage. MGF is watching on the screen. Not happy because, as the commentary mentioned, he would rather face Darby Allen than John Moxley. And that is how the show went off the air. Until, but AEW on TNT tonight, not a bad show, not the greatest show, but hey, it is what it is. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video, find me on Twitter at The France Club, find me on twitch.tv slash The France Club, find me on Instagram at The France Club. And I'll see you guys Friday for SmackDown on Fox. Until then, my name is France, and I'll see you guys later.